أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود أما بعد فقد قال الله الحكيم في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنا أنزلنا عليك الكتاب للناس بالحق فمن اهتدى فإنما يهتدي لنفسه وَمَنْ ضَلَّ فَإِنَّمَا يَطِلُّ عَلَيْهَا وَمَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِوَكِيلٍ صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات اللهم صل على For the love of our beloved Prophet and his beloved progeny, a second loud salawat. For the hastening in the return of our beloved 12th Imam, a third final loud salawat. First and foremost, before we begin tonight's talk, inshallah, I want to congratulate all of our dear brothers and sisters on the birth of our beloved second Imam, Imam Hassan al Mujtaba, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi wa After that, I want to welcome all of our dear community members to the new location and the new facility. And inshallah, with your presence, with your help, with your support, this new facility will turn into our new home. A home and a facility are two different things. It is the community that takes a facility and turns it into a home. Inshallah, with all of your help and support, and with the barakah of a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The topic that we'll be discussing tonight is the topic of community makers and breakers. Those elements and those things, those ingredients that can either make a community, it can help it flourish and grow, or God forbid, it can become detrimental for the community and break the community. And this is something that relates directly with the life of our beloved second Imam because the second Imam who was born in the city of Medina with the details that we will discuss is born into a time where he gets to see firsthand his grandfather, the Holy Prophet, building this community that is the community known as Medina. Before the Prophet came to Medina, Medina was not a community. It was a number of different people from a number of different backgrounds they had many issues, they had many fights with one another, they had many disputes with one another. And so the second Imam gets to see the Prophet take this group of people and actually develop a full-grown community out of this. After the Holy Prophet, the second Imam has an opportunity to witness this same process with the first Imam, that is Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Both of these lead the second Imam to becoming the type of community builder and community leader that gives him the ability to lead the Muslim Ummah at a time later on where things become very sensitive. We know 
during the time of the second Imam, he was dealing with this phenomenon and this problem known as Muawiyah, this head of Bani Umayyah. How he was able to help the Muslim community maneuver this situation is the art of the second Imam and that community building skills that Imam al Hassan had learned from his beloved father and his beloved grandfather. Therefore, this topic directly correlates with the life of our second Imam. And this is extremely important to study and understand. Why? Because if today you go around in every, any community, wherever you go in the world, and you ask people, is your community a successful community? Is your community a flourishing community? Is your community a growing community? You will find that people typically address their community as a community that is growing and successful based on certain elements, based on certain ingredients. For example, if this person looks at you and says, we have this many members in our community, he will consider this to be a factor of the growth and the success of his community. This person might say, we have a facility that is of this type and of this sort. This is why our community is successful. Every night of Ramadan, we feed this many people and so on and so forth. And these are all wonderful things. When you look into the seerah of the Prophet, you find building community for the Prophet went a little bit deeper than these elements. These elements are all good. These elements are all wonderful. There's a deeper level to community building that you find in the seerah of the Prophet. And those are the elements that we want to discuss tonight, inshallah. This is a topic that I've been thinking about discussing for a very, very long time. It happened to fall on this day and it happened to fall on the day moving into the new facility. But it's a topic that's extremely important for all of our communities all around the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of our communities all around the world, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of our masajid and organizations, especially here in Dallas, inshallah. And in order to delve into this topic of what elements break a community or what elements make a community, we'll pose the following questions. Number one, what are the elements that can help a community flourish? And which one of them is probably the most important element of all? That if you looked at that one and that is missing in a community, this is a big red flag and a big problem. And that if it's present in a community, then this means this community has the foundation to grow. Number two, and at the second level, when a companion of the sixth Imam came to him and spoke very highly of the community that he had come from, from the city that he had come from, what evaluation system did the sixth Imam put in front of him? to show him that in fact his community was severely struggling and that his community was not flourishing as much as he had initially thought. Number three, what examples do we find in our communities that shows we have emphasized ritual a lot more that we have emphasized the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt? Number four, what does the Quran teach us as it relates to judging people who come to the masjid Maybe for the first time, maybe once in a while, for example, what does the Quran teach us about this situation? And ask us to refrain from judging a person, even though I know outside of the masjid, they live a life different from the life that they present inside of the masjid. And number five, and finally, what are the elements that can fundamentally break a community? Fundamentally challenge the growth of a community and which one of them, in my humble opinion, is the most detrimental of all. Tonight, inshallah, we'll delve into these five questions with a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. In order to make sure I don't bother you guys in the middle of the talk, I'm going to ask you guys to recite a salawat and everyone please move forward. Loud salawat, please. A second salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Jil Faj. Ya Ali. A third loud salawat. Let us begin from here. A community is not simply a group of people who have gathered in one place. There's a lot of places where people come together. You don't necessarily refer to them as a community. You might be in a bus somewhere on public transportation, though we don't believe in this in Texas. 
And I'm talking about this for Californians, yes? You might be in a bus with a group of people. No one refers to that as a community. You might be in school, but you may not even know the person sitting beside you. It may not necessarily build a community. There are certain elements that build community. If you have these elements that go deeper than the superficial level of community, and then you also have, for example, higher number of members or a better facility that can facilitate what you're doing, then you're golden. Then you have something special on your hands. But if the goal simply becomes the facility, then the community's growth is going to be stagnant. It's not going to grow. There's deeper elements. If you have the deeper ones, and then you have the extra ones, then you have an amazing situation on your hand. But focusing only on the superficial ones, this is going to be a problem. What are those elements that go far deeper than just the basic elements of the growth of the community? Number one, if not the most important of all of the elements that make a community successful, flourish, grow, whatever words you want to add into that sentence, is whether the members of that community care about each other. Whether they care about each other. Are they concerned for each other? Do they go out of their way for each other? This is number one. This is maybe the most important of all. A group of people who come together, they're not a community if they're just coming together. If they come together and he's sitting there and thinking, what's happening in the life of this person? Maybe I can help. What's happening in the life of this person? Maybe I can help. They sit together. They interact with each other. They have concern in their hearts for one another. Now you have a community on your hands. Without that care, that's not a community. That's not growing. That's not flourishing. And this is why the companion of the sixth Imam, Al Imam al Sadiq, when he came to visit the sixth Imam, he said, man khallafta? How are the people you left behind? In other words, your people back home. How are they? Because the Shia were coming from different areas to Medina. Many of us think the Shia were right there in Medina. They wanted to ask the sixth Imam a question, they would go down the alley and ask him a question. That's not the case. Some of them were coming from Persia, some of them were from Qom, some of them from Khurasan, some of different parts. He said, كَيْفَ مَنْ خَلَّفْتَ How are the people you left behind? Tell me about your community, in my terminology. So this man, he sat there and he said, Oh, my community, they're so special. وَأَثْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَتْرَى He started to speak so highly of his people. The sixth Imam asked him a question. He said, do the wealthy in your community ever sit with the poor in your community? قال, he said, قليلتون. That doesn't happen too often. That was his response. So then he continued. He said, let me ask you another question. How often do the wealthy in your community take care of the poor in your community? He said, يا ابن رسول الله, These are characteristics we don't find amongst ourselves. The sixth Imam turned to him. He said, How do they assume then they're walking in our footsteps? They call themselves Shia. That's not a community of Shia. A community of Shia are individuals who care about one another. This is why you find a multitude of different narrations in our hadith corpus. They continuously speak of the rights of one believer over the other believer. And it's very interesting. Because in these narrations, many times the Imam tells his companion, I don't want to tell you too many of these rights because you won't be able to uphold them and God will hold you accountable. It's so heavy, if I tell you and you're not able to do it, it'll be a bigger problem for you. But in some narrations, the Imam shares some of these, sometimes three, sometimes five, sometimes seven. In this narration, the Imam, the sixth Imam, he shares seven of those rights that the believer has upon his brother. When we say his brother, it doesn't mean his relative. It means the one who's within the scope of, first of all, Islam, and to a certain extent, wilaya as well. This is your brother. It's part of this category. What are the seven characteristics or the seven rights that Imam al-Sadiq said are the rights of your brother upon you? Allah salawat, please. Allahumma salawat, Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. He said, number one, al-ijlal lahu fi You have to honor him. Can't disrespect him. Number two, wal-wud lahu fi sadrih. 
He has to have love and affection for him in his heart. Number three, He has to take from his wealth and help him out when he's in need. Number four, He has to make it such that backbiting about his believers considered forbidden to him. People do it in front of him. He says, no, no, you're not supposed to be doing this. Number five, he said, When he gets ill, he has to go and visit him. And then you would assume this is the end because after this is probably the end of the life of this person. But the rights of a believer on another believer don't end while this person is alive. They extend until after he has left this world. Meaning I have loved ones they've left, they still have a right on you. So what other right is there after this person's left this world? He said, the next one, وَأَنْ يُشَيِّعَ جَنَازَتَهُ when they bring his body, he has to do tashi'ah of the body of his brother. So what else is there? We put him in the grave, it's over, nothing else. He said, if he's your brother, number seven, if he's your brother, even after he's gone, you can't say anything wrong about him. And in some narrations, there's an eighth one added, that when he's gone now, you have to take care of his family. This is what builds community. And this care for each community member represents itself in a different way. Of those ways that it represents itself is how welcoming the atmosphere of the masjid is. When I come to the masjid, do I feel welcomed? Do I feel like I'm part of a family? Do I feel like I'm part of a community? This is, these are moments of introspection and thought for myself first and foremost and then the rest of us as well. How often do you hear someone says, I've been going to this masjid for six months, a year. I haven't even made one friend yet. This is a problem. This is an issue we have. In our communities across the world, alhamdulillah, I'm blessed to have the ability to travel now and visit different communities and see all the greats and sometimes the challenges as well. This is a problem. Imagine the reward. Someone walks into the masjid. They've come for the first time. Maybe they've come for the second time. Maybe the last time they came was three years ago. They feel a little uncomfortable coming this time, but they come. Imagine if you had built the culture and people come up to this person. They welcome them. Welcome, are you new? What are you looking for? Do you need any help? Let me introduce you to my friends. Is there anything else I can help you with? You think this person's gonna forget that experience? That person will not forget that experience. But we haven't built this culture. Sometimes people come into the masjid, they leave without even speaking to one other person. And this is something that we have to work on. One of those areas that shows the care of community members for each other is how they welcome one another when they come to the masjid. Let us move on to the second way we can show care for one another. Allah salawat please. Allahum salam. Another way this care shows itself is the humility that they show one another. This person walks in, he wants the best spot. Yes? When he walks in, does he feel like he's supposed to be served? Or does he feel like he's there to serve? This is the care we show in our communities, yes? How much humility we show. This is why when it came to the Prophet, his companions used to say, and this is famous in history, that when we used to come and see him, he was sitting in a circle. We couldn't tell which one is the prophet, which one is the follower. So they're all sitting in one circle. It's difficult to tell which one is leading, which one is following the leader. The humility that they show. Number three of the ways that they show care for one another is what? Is the way that they forgive one another. Community, hundreds of people, thousands of people. Not everyone might have the best akhlaq. Not everyone might be saying everything exactly the right way. Shaykh Mahdi might say something that maybe offends you. This is the reality of life. Sometimes he may not even know that it offends you, for example. We have to build a culture of, yes, this didn't happen the way I wanted to, but it's okay, I want to move on with life. Otherwise, what situation do you have? You have the situation where a family says, you know what? I can't put my foot in this masjid anymore. And who's going to be deprived from the blessings of the masjid? The family, the children who are supposed to be growing up in this masjid. They're going to be deprived now. 
a sense of forgiveness. The first and most important elements that build community are the community members that show care for one another. The second of those elements is an emphasis on knowledge that is balanced with ritual. In our communities, brothers and sisters, I'm speaking on an international level, so to speak, yes? This is not relating to Texas, and so this is talking on a much greater level, yes? In our communities, we have emphasized ritual and emotion so much more than knowledge. You want to see the sign of this? You want to see the proof of this? Tell people, listen, this day let's come together. We're going to sing the praises of the Ahl bayt We're going to speak highly of them. See how many people show up out of love for the Ahl bayt And it's beautiful. And then tell our communities, come today, we're going to learn about the Ahl bayt Then all of a sudden, that gap. Yes, the gap is a big gap. Jokingly, I told one of my friends, I said, if you tell people we're going to sing the praises, yes, a thousand people will show. Say, we're going to learn, all of a sudden that thousand turns into 100. This is something we have to work on. Knowledge, brothers and sisters, is no longer a good option to have. Our communities and our children need deep knowledge of Islam. Today, every little thing you do in the masjid, there's a question mark that pops up beside it. Simple things. Say, we're going to recite a Fatiha for our marhumin. This 15-year-old is going to ask a question. Wait a second. This person has already passed away. Now you're reciting Fatiha for him. But he didn't work for this Fatiha. So how does that work? The parent might sit there and say, listen, don't worry about this stuff, beta. Just come. Just come and recite the Fatiha. It's over. But that question is going to remain in his mind. We're going to go visit the graveyard. Why? We're going to do all these a'mal. God cares about these a'mal. Why? Everything we do has a why beside it. If I'm only emphasizing ritual, I'm not going to be able to survive as a community. Not us. Any faith community out there will not be able to survive. And this is why you find other faiths even in some ways are taking big hits in this area. Because the knowledge isn't there. It was all about love. Where's the basis? Where's the foundation? No, he loves you. That's enough. This is not going to sustain itself in today's day and age. The second of those elements is knowledge and balancing it with ritual. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And of those situations that you can find that knowledge is not emphasized enough, brothers and sisters, is when you will find people will come to the community events. There's a recitation happening. Quran is being recited. A hadith is being recited. Something is being recited. A dua is being recited. And the people sitting there with their own children will not take out their phones to read the translation of that dua. This parent, in his mind, is accomplishing the goal. My son was there. My daughter was there. Okay, but did your daughter or son understand what you were doing? You didn't take the effort to open up your phone, tell your son to scoot in, and tell you, listen, here, let's read the translation. At least you can pick up something from the translation. No, you told him to just sit there and stare at the wall. Of course he's not going to be able to connect with that. This is what? This is checking the box versus balancing knowledge and ritual. The third of the elements that can make a community, brothers and sisters, is their relationship with the Qur'an. A community will not grow until Qur'anic verses and concepts become second nature for the community. And this is an area that we have not invested in. This is an area we have to do a better job with. There are other areas I will get to we've done a good job with, alhamdulillah. This is an area we are severely lacking in. The fourth of those elements, salat, especially doing it in jama'ah and in congregation. This is an important element. This is part of how the Prophet built his community. The Prophet built his community around the masjid. Because it was built around salat, built around jama'ah prayer. Why do you think we have all these narrations? They say if you do jama'ah salat, it's 20 times the reward, 30 times the reward. I don't know, 50 times the reward. Different narrations have different things. Because it builds a community. Let us move on now to number five. Before we uh, continue, inshallah, if we can recite a salawat and everyone please move forward. Allahum <laughs> salam. Allah. 
Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad A third loud salawat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad I still see a lot of empty spots and I don't want to bother you guys again in the middle. So one more loud salawat and let's move forward as much as we can inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil faraj. One more loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Of those elements, number five, that can build a community is when the individuals in that community come together to revive and remember the Ahlul Bayt. This area, Alhamdulillah, we've done a good job with. This is a blessing that we have in our lives, that connection that we have with the Ahlul Bayt. And this is why the sixth Imam, Al Imam Sadiq, Salawatullahi wa Salam wa Muhammad Muhammad was speaking to his companion Fudayl. He said, Ya Fudayl, Tajlisoon wa tuhadithoon? Do you guys get together? Do you sit with one another? And do you speak to one another and speak to one another about our affairs? Speak about our fadail, speak about our virtues, speak about our teachings. Do you guys do that? Do you have your own gatherings? He said, Jo'al tu fidak, yes. We definitely do that. The sixth Imam said, Inna tilka majalis, those gatherings, uhibbuha, I love them. They're beloved to me. This one, alhamdulillah, we have done a wonderful job with. Number six of those elements, brothers and sisters, is how you plan and invest for your youth and your next generation. This is another one that we have a long way to go in. A long way. In most communities that you visit, whether it's here, it's Australia, it's UK, it's Canada, wherever you go, most communities that you visit, the idea behind the youth event is what? It's just the normal events. At the end, the youth are going to sit for another 10 minutes to have a Q&A with Molana. And when they have the Q&A, all of the mothers and fathers are still there, by the way. So there she or he asked the wrong question. And you're in trouble now. This is not how we invest in our youth. There needs to be a constant planning and strategizing. What are we going to do next year? And of those elements that make a youth event successful is what? Is that the youth themselves plan it. Give them autonomy. In the majority of our communities, they don't have autonomy. They don't have the ability to come together and say, you know what we think our peers would really take pleasure in and enjoy is this. That's missing. Number six is youth. Number seven is religious leadership. How can I run a masjid when the person who's making the decisions is not an alim? That's a problem. That's something we have to work on. Oh, but Shaykh, this person has wonderful intentions. Alhamdulillah. His intentions are probably purer than mine. But intention is one thing. Expertise is a different thing. Yes, you never go to the doctor who flunked his medical school and you say, but no, it's okay. He has pure intentions. We don't do that. We don't do that with any other area of life. Only area of life where we give ourselves the permission to do this is religious issues. Number seven is religious leadership. And number eight, brothers and sisters, of those things that makes community, builds community, is vision. Where are you headed? What are your priorities? What's your strategy? How are you going to go about things? What's the end goal? Is the end goal just to hold some programs? What's the end goal? Vision. These eight brothers and sisters are those things that make a community. And then there are those elements that break a community, that challenge the growth of a community. We'll go into those with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Number one of those things that can break a community, that can challenge a community. The first of those elements is how rumors spread. 
one of the elements that shows the health of a community is how fast or slow rumors spread in that community. Sometimes, if 5% of the community knows something, which by the way is not the business of the community, it's a personal issue of some person's life. Before you know it, everybody knows. It's not a good thing. There was a brother who was speaking to me recently, yes, he had gone through a development in his life, it wasn't a positive development. He shared it with me. Then I was, you know, empathizing with him. I said, I'm so sorry that you went through this. He said, Sheikh, I thought you know. I said, no, this is the first time you're telling me. He said, yeah, but people talk. I thought the news had gotten to you by now. I said, no, it didn't get to me, and I'm glad it didn't get to me. That's a sign of health in a community where the personal incidents in the lives of people do not spread, at least not quickly, hopefully. This is one of the signs of the health of the community versus when one thing that is the business of this person is spread all over the community. There are certain things they affect people. Okay, you want to discuss that, that's fine. But there are certain things, they're personal business of this person. Why is it in every single WhatsApp group? Why is it shared everywhere? Some of these things we have to answer for. We have to be careful about this. This is one of those things that breaks a community. Number two of those things that breaks a community is judgmental behavior. So this person walks into the masjid and you know his life outside of the masjid is very different from his life inside of the masjid. So then all of a sudden you'll see the glances, you'll see the looks, you'll see the avoidance, you'll see this and that. Who gave you or me permission to judge the character of this person? The topic of judgment we've spoken about in the past. You can judge an action. If someone doesn't pray, you can sit there and say, you know what, I don't think it's good that this person prays or doesn't pray rather, yes? Not praying is not a good thing. You don't want to make that judgment. God already made that judgment. It's not even you. God already said not fasting is not a good idea. God already said this sin, drinking, is haram. It's not a good idea. God already said all this. But you want to judge the whole character of this person? And now you want to put yourself in a per, uh, situation, in a position to see, should I give this person permission to come to the masjid or not? Who are you? Who am I? We're specks of dust with a million sins ourselves. We have to be very cautious, brothers and sisters. Yes, people who come to the masjid, including myself, the one who's sitting on this mimba, we have challenges, we have struggles. That's why we come to the masjid. We come to the masjid to heal those issues. We have to be very careful. Judgmental behavior can break a community. Element number two, moving on to element number three. Those who are involved in serving the community have to approach it with an attitude and an approach of service, not entitlement. Sheikh Mahdi can't sit up here and say, yes, now we're going to do this lecture. And you all are blessed that you're listening to me. That's a problem. Sheikh Matthias has come and sit here and say, I'm glad I have the opportunity to serve. It's a big difference between the two. And you know what happens when management approaches things from an angle of, I want to serve? Other people like to get involved. And management starts to make room for other people to get involved. They don't feel, and I don't feel like this is mine. Who are you? This is a community center, belongs to everyone. This brother has come forward, he says he wants to help out with this. If he can, if he has the ability, why not? Yes, you have to adjust. Yes, you have to work with another person who has other characteristics compared to you. He might have a little bit of a different approach, but if he's taking care of the bare minimums, if he has good akhlaq when he's dealing with people, why not? This is number three, approaching it from an approach of service from an angle of service, not from an angle of entitlement. And number four, the final element of those elements that can break a community is what? Is when the members of the community feel like, you know what, there's 10, 15%, 20% of people, they'll take care of the burden. I don't have to participate. I don't have to contribute. I can go and benefit, but I'm not gonna contribute. This culture is something we have to work on. 
And many times you will find it goes back to, you know, our childhood even. Then when you look in other schools of thought and in other faiths where they have built a culture where no, if you're part of something, you're also contributing it to it as well, you will see how far these communities go. This person says, I'm part of this community. I know I'm supposed to contribute. In what way and in what shape, I'll figure that out. But I'm responsible to contribute to this culture. And this is what the Prophet built into how he built his community in Medina from the very beginning. What did the Prophet do when he entered into Medina? When the Prophet entered into Medina, he was going to build a beautiful community. Yes? One more loud salawat and let us please move forward. A second salawat. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A third salawat. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. How did the Prophet build this community? The Prophet was dealing with individuals who came from very different backgrounds. Each one of them came from a different tribe. Each one of them came sometimes from different languages even. Brought all of them together. How did he bring all of them together? Because he built in every one of them a sense of community and a sense of cohesiveness and a sense of being together and a sense of responsibility. They came together for a bigger cause. That's what held them together. So when the Prophet entered into Medina, he was going to build his community. You know how the Prophet started building his community? The whole community of the Prophet was built around the masjid. And the masjid for the Prophet was not just a place for people to come and pray. It was a place for people to come and learn. It was a place for people to come and potentially meet, meet their future spouse. It was a place for people to come and benefit from all of the different facets of this masjid. The Prophet built a multifaceted masjid. It wasn't one dimensional. Someone's being born, someone's leaving this world. Someone has a problem, someone has a question. All of these things revolved around what? Revolved around that masjid of the prophets. So the prophet came into Medina, he starts working. This is how he builds culture. This is that character, that star that we look at in the skies. This is the character that the second imam is looking and learning from. The prophet came into Medina and said, we have to build a masjid. Then they started to lift up these bricks, every one of them from every corner, go moving all these bricks, heavy bricks, to start to build this masjid. Then they saw, oh, the Prophet's working too. So they came to him, they said, Ya Rasulullah, I mean, you don't need to take care of any of this. You don't need to worry about any of this. Let us take care of it. And the Prophet told them, go, if your hands are empty, you're worried about me, go and grab an extra one so that we can build this masjid faster, can build this masjid sooner. And then the prophets and the muhajireen and ansar, they used to recite poetry. Look at this poetry they used to recite. They used to say, لَإِنْ قَعَدْنَا If we sit, وَالنَّبِيُّ يَعْمَلُ And the prophet of God is working, لَذَلِكَ مِنَّا الْعَمَلُ الْمُضَلُّ That's a very bad thing. It's very bad if I'm sitting here and the prophet is working. I have a sense of responsibility. I have a sense that I have to contribute, yes? And then the Prophet would respond to them. He used to say, La Aisha illa Aisha al Akhira. True happiness comes in the hereafter. Allahumma arhamil ansara wal muhajira. Oh Allah, bless the ansar and the muhajireen. All from different backgrounds. Each one of them picking up these bricks. This is how the Prophet built this community around himself. And then in history, it's narrated and it's attributed to the first Imam, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salawatullahi wa salamu That during this time, he was also reciting poetry. He said, لا يستوي من يعمر المساجدا. The one who works hard, gets his hands dirty. To build this masjid is not the same. وَمَنْ يَرَى عَنِ الْغُبَارِ حَائِدًا And the one who doesn't want to get any dust on his clothing. He said, these two are not the same. This one feels a sense of responsibility. He wants to contribute in whatever shape he can. This one, he pulls himself aside. He says, let the others go and do it. When it's all ready, inshallah, I'll take care of it. 
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those elements that can make a community, He blesses our community with this. And those elements that God forbid can break or challenge a community, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us and all of our communities, inshallah, from these elements. Inshallah, we'll end by reciting Surah Al Fatiha for all of your marhumin and marhumat. I'm going to transition, inshallah, to the fundraising portion that we, I had mentioned and announced before. So as we transition into that, let us take a moment to recite Surah Al Fatiha for all of your marhumin and marhumat especially the marhumin and marhumat of the sponsors of tonight's program with a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allah. 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 Allah.